Hello, mother factors. My name is Sam, and well, you could be feeling a bit confused. Has he passed out on his keyboard and accidentally put a period in the middle of a number, like some kind of punctuation lunatic? Well, first of all, it's a full stop. I am British after all. But secondly, it was no error. It was sort of to trick you into clicking on this by accident. Whoops. You see, I'd like to bring you some more nutritional facts into your weekly diet. And while I'm already giving you 202 facts a week, let's make it a little bit more, shall we? If you enjoy it, let me know in the comments below and I might be able to give you even more than that. Wouldn't that be lovely? Hey, you need to let me know first, otherwise I don't know when to do it, do I? So, so here I stand before you, a man wanting to fax you into oblivion, with today's portion featuring mozzarella, medieval diss tracks and the easiest way to be a published scientist ever. Tasty. Without further ado, here's 10.1 facts, all for you. 1. How beer cures disease Let's hop back to 1850, to a time of steam carriages, morphine and waterborne disease. It really was a great century. The city of London was swept by a plague of cholera. While that sounds like a surprisingly tasty Coke substitute, it didn't taste anywhere near as nice. Mainly due to the fact it was an infection that was deadly in a matter of hours. Yes, cholera was more successful than Sam Smith at being an utter buzzkill, causing the deaths of over 30,000 people across two decades. Not that I'm suggesting Sam Smith could literally do the same thing, but his Bond theme was really a bit boring, wasn't it? Anyway, I digress. Cholera was a big problem in 1800s London. After all, there was no known cure for it either, and it seemed to affect almost everybody. That almost word, by the way, is important, so hold on to it. What were the people of 19th century London to do? Enter Jon Snow. That's not a command, by the way, that's just a fake stage direction. Yes, neither King in the North nor hit star of Channel 4 News, this Jon Snow was a physicist who decided he had had enough of cholera and its sassy spree of death. He deduced, all Sherlock style, that actually the cause of the cholera spreading was contaminated water. Part of his evidence for this is that there were 70 people that were perfectly healthy. Well, maybe not perfectly, this is the 19th century after all, where syphilis was pretty much a greeting. Point is though, no cholera. Why? Well, these guys worked in a local brewery and drank only beer. Snow, therefore, came to the conclusion that because these guys had a cold one with the lads instead of precious water from contaminated pumps and survived, the water was the problem. And it turns out he was right. However, his arguments were dismissed before he died, but now he's known as the father for modern epidemiology. All thanks to some beer and a good old noggin. You know lots, Jon Snow. Classic Photoshop work there. <laughs> Two, who run the world? <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. The power of ladies is something that's felt all throughout society these days, with the likes of Beyonce, the Spice Girls, and Jennifer Lawrence. But luckily for men, girl power is something that we can get in on too. Woohoo! Because we don't already have enough as it is. <coughs> the fact of the matter is that we were all girls once. Well, if the 15th century was anything to go by, and I for one say that it is. You see, back then the word girl just meant child. So, unless you're a midlife crisis written Benjamin Button, we've all been a girl before. Back then, if you were a knave girl, you were a male child, or a gay girl if you were a female child. Gay sounds a lot more fun than knave, because gay literally means carefree, whereas knave meant a dishonest man. Wow, girls really do have more fun. Gay girls have the best, I hear. 3. The Dream Stealing Beetle I'm not sure if you've heard of them as they're pretty obscure, but the Beatles used to be a band that were a real hit on the top of the pops back in the day. The best Liverpudlian foursome since, well, Ever. They turned out hit after hit after hit with songs like Bohemian Rhapsody, I'm Blue Dabby Dee Dabby Die and Despacito, just off the top of my head. Anyway, one big tune for them was a song called Yesterday, which legally I can't play, so I'll play some music that sounds a bit like it instead. That'll do. It was written by Paul McCartney, who upon writing it became terrified he'd done so in a burst of cryptonesia. What is this word, apart from sounding like a terrible budget horror found in a dusty bin at CEX, I hear you ask? Well, it's the phenomena of a returning forgotten memory as a new idea, so as if you came up with something new all by yourself. For example, I don't know, the idea of a planet of blue people invaded by greedy humans for minerals, so one of those humans pretends to be one of the blue people through technology, that's an idea I've just come up with now. If uh, someone else comes up with that idea, whether it's theirs or not, it was my original concept all along. Anyway, McCartney had actually dreamt the melody for the song in his own head, but was terrified he had subconsciously plagiarised another artist. Eventually, he spent weeks playing the song for people in the music biz, asking if they'd heard it before. Nobody said they had, so Paul kept it and made it into the song we all know today. Seriously though, Blue Planet people, that's my idea. Maybe I'll cast Zoe Saldana in the film of it. Yeah, sounds good. 
Four, cheeses in many pies. From Beatles to Pizzles now, have you ever had a Domino's and thought that it tastes a bit like Pizza Hut or a Pizza Hut and thought it tastes a bit like Papa John's, etc, etc? Well, that's not just because all pizza tastes the glorious, beautiful same. Have you ever heard of Leprino? Well, you should have done because they've been inside you. Don't worry, Leprino isn't a lecherous Italian man, but it is an American company specializing in cheese and whey. Why am I telling you about these guys? Well, because they're actually a pretty big deal. They make $3 billion in revenue a year, mainly because the company sells its cheddar and mozzarella to the likes of Domino's, Pizza Hut, and even Papa John's. In fact, it makes enough cheese for 85% of the market for pizza cheese. They could legitimately take over the planet with cheese. Well, maybe not literally, you can't use cheese as a weapon unless you're fighting the lactose intolerance, but, you know, figuratively speaking. So. Thanks, Leprinos. Without you, we wouldn't have pizza. And that's genuinely the only thing that keeps me going these days. Really, send help. Five, sign language lols. Sign language is actually a pretty important thing to learn as over 5% of the population of the world goes through hearing loss. It's a vital way for them to communicate, but it's not without its puns. Today, I can teach you how to say milk in American sign language. Yep, you're welcome, but there's something extra going on here. So here's milk, are you ready? There you go, that's milk, ta-da. But what if you want your cow squirts pasteurized, as so many people do? What then? Well, here's how you say pasteurized milk in sign language. Get it? It's the same as milk, but it's going pasteurized. <laughs> oh man, deaf people have all the fun, I imagine. Actually, they probably don't, it's probably horrible. So, sorry if you're listening to the, oh, you won't be. Uh, oh. Six, rap battles older than your mama. Apologies for the sick burn there, but I just had to stick it in. Another thing that I said to your mama. Zing! Sorry for all the maternal-based sexism. I was just getting into the mood because I'm about to talk about rap battles, son! Though rap is a modern art form of ciphers, rhymes, and indeed gangbangers, the rap battle has actually been around for thousands of years, specifically since the 5th century. This was actually known as flighting in England and Scotland, a battle of insults and wits. It comes from the old Norse word for quarrel, meaning Thor probably gets in on throwdown action too. In it, they would shout provocative insults at one another, often poetically, so they rhyme and all that kind of stuff. In fact, Kings James IV and James V in 16th century Scotland liked court flighting to be performed for them. This would mean two intelligent men would assemble and have at it in a war of words. It was even the first recorded usage of using poo as an insult. So, thanks Scotland for 8 Mile. It was a proper laugh. Number 7. Too little, too late. From the story of one Samuel to another now, specifically Samuel Morse. Morse was a painter and inventor and the man who co-developed Morse code, thus the um, name. He also helped the invention of the telegraph messaging system, though quite how this came into being is steeped in tragedy. Morse was painting in Washington DC while his family stayed in New York. One day he received a message from a guy on a horse, a messenger, not just a random guy on a horse, from his father saying that his wife's health was depleting. Only the next day he received another saying that she was dead. By the time he got back to New York, she'd already been buried. Morse made it his mission to try and develop a method of long distance communication on a quicker scale to avoid incidents like this. He then helped develop a concept for an electromagnetic signal wire telegraph using Morse code. You know, the do -do -do -do. It's basically the grounding for all modern communication and it all came from a dead wife. I guess good, some things have good silver linings. Sorry, Morsey. Number eight, North Korea's fake news jamboree. Twitter is a wonderful thing. I should know, I'm on it right here. Shameless plug, I'm also verified. <laughs> it's full of laughs and jokes and gags, but sometimes those laughs and jokes and gags go a bit too far and get mistaken for things that aren't laughs and jokes and gags, but actually very much true. For instance, take the account DPRK News. It's got 274,000 followers, almost as many subscribers as us. It's a satirical account pretending to be North Korea's news service. I mean, if you look at it, it's pretty much obviously a joke, right? I mean, if you were a legit news organization, say like the New York Times or Newsweek or Buzzfeed or Fox News, you wouldn't actually believe that this is a genuine source of North Korean news, right? Well, it turns out, yeah, you would. Because that's exactly what happened. It started out of boredom, but the satirical account DPRK News keeps getting quoted by the media as a legit source. Of course, North Korea don't actually have Twitter. They're a country that apparently bans sarcasm. Do you know how much of that is on Twitter? It's probably the North Korean version of the dark web, for Pete's sake. I don't know who Pete is. 9. Cows versus Sharks It's the ultimate showdown you never knew you wanted, but, well, who could win, do you think? Hmm? Well, if that fight is a battle of mortality rates, it turns out the cow is victorious. For all their big teeth and scary eyes and movies all about them, sharks are actually pretty docile. 
They only viciously murder around five people a year worldwide, according to non-profit organization Oceana. This is mainly because once a shark bites you, it actually hates the taste of humans and so will swim away all disgusted, like I do if I ingest avocado. No, really, it's cows you should be scared of. These milk squirting beef sacks kill on average 22 people a year in America, and in the UK, over the past 15 years, 74 people have been killed by them. This is mainly the case of a new calf is around, because those baby mamas get hella protective. So watch out for those bovine guys, or revenge those who have fallen by eating as many steaks as you can. That's what I'm gonna do right after this. Number 10, the procrastinator's dream. So let's say you want to be a scientist. It sounds like an awful lot of work, right? I mean, writing report after report after report, all for a few letters after your name, gah! <laughs> What's the bare minimum you could do for a scientific paper? Well, it turns out the shortest one ever produced was zero words long. Yep, in 1974, a psychologist by the name of Dennis Upper wrote a paper, fabulously named, The Unsuccessful Self-Treatment of a Case of Writer's Block. His aim was to combat writer's block simply by writing about it. However, he got writer's block while writing about writer's block. It's pretty much the definition of irony. So there you go. Title your paper and examine look at procrastination and just spend your days watching The Real Housewives of Norwich or something in a lab and then hand it in. It's pretty much the same thing and bang, you'll be a real scientist. Thank me later. Not guaranteed. Now is the moment you've all been waiting for, the point one. It's the bit that confused you in the title, I'm sure, but you're about to see why it's a groundbreaker. Are you ready? I reckon a duck would win in a fight with a chicken. The beak isn't a sharp, no, but the swipe could get really deep and then trip it over and then peck, peck, peck a clock. It's chicken for dinner. <laughs> Told you, definitely worth it. So there was your first dollop of 10.1 fact. Do you want to see more? Have you missed my face? Let me know in the old comms down below. And hey, while you're at it, watch these videos too. They're really quite something. I'm sure I'll see you soon. Bye bye.